Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. One of the criticisms that gets made against utilitarianism as a moral and political theory is that, in some respect, it's unjust. It goes against our conceptions, however we happen to have arrived at them, of justice. So there would be a disjunction between the, uh, as Mill says, the just or the moral and the expedient and the useful. This is uh, quite a, a common misunderstanding in his view of how utilitarianism, particularly the kind of utilitarianism that he himself is advocating and he, which he takes Jeremy Bentham, the originator of utilitarianism in the Western tradition, to have also been articulating. The basic idea in his response is to say that justice is really a way in which we think about what has the most utility, and we give it a particular emphasis, one that uh, allows us to engage you know, the state or, or other uh, ways of sanctioning involved in, in punishing, to protect uh, something that's of great value. And, but what's of great value in this case? The utility, that is the benefit uh, maximized for as much as we can across the, the system of all, and the harms minimized as much as possible, again, for the aggregate of human beings within the community. So the question is, does utilitarianism conflict with justice? And Mill is trying to say that no, it really doesn't, but we have to see why that's the case. So he tells us uh, a few things. One is that the idea of justice itself involves two things. He says a rule of conduct, how we ought to behave, how we ought to decide things, how we ought to say apportion goods, and a sentiment which sanctions the rule. So notice that he's, he's saying that justice doesn't just include a rule. It's not just a decision procedure. It's also something that we feel. It's a sentiment, a moral sentiment, in fact, not just a pure emotional response, uh, but something that has a kind of rationale to it and that we find uh, rooted in our own psyches, sanctioning, he says, the rule. He says this, this first, the rule must be supposed common to all mankind and intended for their good. The other is a desire that punishment may be suffered by those who infringe the rule. And Mill is a very, you know, uh, typical enlightened man of the 19th century, but he still thinks that there is some need for punishment in this, in this, in order to have justice. So he tells us that um, there is an involved also the conception of some definite person who suffers, uh, whose rights, and we're going to talk about rights in, in another uh, discussion, uh, are violated. And he says, the sentiment of justice appears to me uh, to be the animal desire to repel or retaliate some hurt or damage. That's, that's what's involved in this sentiment. And then he says, how does this play out? And, and again, if we think about this in utilitarian ways, uh, this, this makes a lot of sense. It's not just about oneself. He talks about enlightened self-interest, but we also feel a sense of sympathy for others who are hurt or damaged by the actions or the, the inactions of other people. So he says those who we are united to by sympathy, 
Um, you know, and, and that, that could be so widened as to include all persons so that, you know, injustice anywhere is of concern to us, right? That is what he thinks is involved in the very notion of justice. Now, is this compatible with utilitarianism? Mill says, yes, and as a matter of fact, if you want justice to be fully realized, you need to, in fact, be a utilitarian. This is a, a rather controversial position to take in his own time and indeed even in our own because it seems that there could be some things that the utilitarians would be for that might be unjust. So Mill then attempts to provide some sort of argument for why it is that justice itself realizes a greater utility, and that's why, in fact, we, we should uh, recognize and, and involve and include justice within utilitarianism. So he talks first about violation of rights. He's got some interesting examples here that I think are, are worth um, thinking about. He says that... Um, when we say that, that something is a person's right, we mean they have a valid claim on society to protect them in the possession of it, either by the force of law or by that of education and opinion. Uh, and then he says, a person, for example, has a right to what he can earn in fair professional competition. Why? Because society ought not to allow any other person to hinder him from endeavoring to earn in that matter as much as he can. So if you're a laborer, um, society should not try to keep you from earning uh, something from your labor. Uh, nor should other people interfere with that and say, shut you out and make it impossible for you to engage in that. Now, notice the next thing that he says. He doesn't have a right to 300 pounds a year, even though he may happen to be earning it. That was at one, at one time a lot of money. Because society is not called on to provide that he shall earn that sum. Um, so what do we have a right to? It, it's going to depend on how it's specified. We have legal rights. We have moral rights. Um, much of what we nowadays call human rights are hopefully enshrined in some sort of law, but they're definitely what Mill is calling a moral right. So that, that's quite, quite important. Now, uh, when a violation of rights occurs, what takes place if we think about this as utilitarians? There is definitely a trade-off in pleasures or advantages and pains and disadvantages between the person whose you know, rights are infringed. Obviously, uh, there's some sort of hurt or damage to them, but perhaps somebody else benefits from it. You know, maybe if we think about, you know, something like the right of eminent domain, right? We say that it's okay for us to take people's property because, you know, the government could use it for, for something. That's not the only justification of it. And if that really was the only justification, Mill would say, you're not entitled to, to have eminent domain. Why? Because overall, when rights are violated, there is a lowered utility across the board. Why would that be the case? Mill says that this is because we can no longer count on our own rights not being violated when somebody else's rights are being violated with impunity. We lose security, and security itself is part of a, a, a good. As a matter of fact, if you think about how utilitarians calculate pleasures and pains, one of the key components of it is how likely it is that we're able to enjoy and continue to enjoy that pleasure. So he, he goes on and he says, um, the interest involved is that of security to everyone's feelings, the most vital of all interests. All other earthly benefits are needed by one person, not needed by another. And many of them can, if necessary, be cheerfully foregone. Security, no human being can possibly do without if we depend uh, on, if we depend for all our immunity from evil and for the whole value of all and every good beyond the passing moment. If we cannot rely 
upon society, the social fabric, the, the individuals who were associated with, not to violate our rights, we have a dramatic lowering of utility. And not just us, everybody involved, including perhaps even the person who is violating the rights. Because they can't count on other people not doing the same thing to them. So what does this mean? This means that if we consider justice in, in terms of maintaining or respecting rights, we do so because of the higher utility in maintaining or respecting rights. Justice and utilitarianism turn out not only to be compatible, but to require each other. He also talks about equality and impartiality. He says this is very important to people as well, right? What happens if we show partiality? Let's say we engage you know, in a society where there's lots of corruption. It's great for the people who are able to benefit from it, who can bribe their way into whatever they want. How does everyone else feel about it? They think it sucks. They're like, this is, this is garbage. And so there's, there's an overall negative utility to that. But... Um, what's going to be particularly important here is where this impartiality comes from. So he says, this is an obligation of justice, right? It's a necessary condition of the fulfillment of other obligations of justice. Um, and he says, you know, you could try to derive it from the notion that everybody should get what they deserve. If everybody's more or less the same, they all deserve more or less the same thing. So if somebody is not, say, a criminal or a chronic abuser of the system, then they deserve for the system to look out for them just as much as it does for anybody else. We should, and if you're a part of that system, you know, making judgments, well, then you should make those judgments impartially. You should treat equal cases equally. Right? Not, you know, give your neighbor a break and punish the people who live down, down in a different part of town. Or make, the ba make a judgment based on gender or race or religion or any of the other things that, that we, we think divide us. Mill says, well, that's kind of true, but there's really a, something else that we derive equality and impartiality from. The greatest happiness principle, which is intrinsic to utilitarianism. He tells us this great moral duty rests on a deeper foundation. It's, it's an, an emanation from the first principle of morals. What is that? It is involved in the very meaning of utility or the greatest happiness principle. He says, this is the, the doctrine that um, unless one person's happiness is supposed equal in degree, uh, is counted for exactly as much as another's. This is, this is intrinsic to utilitarianism. You're supposed to be impartial. You're supposed to treat equal cases equally. That's what the whole moral theory requires. So again, it turns out in this case that not only is utilitarianism not incompatible with justice, it is going to lead to justice. There's one last thing that needs to be observed. Uh, this is an important thing that I didn't put on the board, but which Mill is going to talk about. He, uh, well, actually, there, there, there's, there's, there's two things. One is that he's going to say that um, what we mean by, by justice, he says, is certain social utilities which are vastly more important and therefore more absolute and imperative than any others as a class. That is why we want to have not just the rule of conduct, but this sentiment that sanctions them. That is why we don't want to back off on insisting that justice be done and injustice be punished. Because if we were to do so, we would actually violate the greatest happiness principle. He does point out that there are going to be some tough cases. There will be some conditions in which we have to really think to figure out what the just thing is. And in those cases, we do need to apply the greatest happiness principle. We need to think about what is for the benefit of the larger number. And perhaps if, if it's going to happen to the harm of the lesser number, but only when that's, that's absolutely required. So he says that 
Um, there, there may be some social duties that are so important as to override any of the general maximums of justice. So, for example, to save a life, it may not only be allowable, but a duty to steal or take by force the necessary food or medicine. But that doesn't mean that taking food or medicine uh, by force thereby becomes okay. It just means that in that circumstance, because of the way the greatest happiness principle is going to apply, it is allowable in that circumstance. It is, it is required. Uh, he also talks, a funny example here, about kidnapping a doctor, right? Kidnapping and compelling to officiate the only qualified medical practitioner. Um, this is the stuff that, that you know, uh, interesting movies are made of, aren't they? Um, but these exceptional cases really just prove, according to Mill, the rule of the greatest happiness principle. So as it turns out, justice and utility are entirely compatible with each other.